Yo, this is the comedian Rome Anthony. I'm sitting here on this virtual interview with Go Mag, Go Bang Magazine. What's up, Pierre? What's happening? What's happening, man? So let me let me audio answer these questions. First of all, you said where did I grow up and spend my childhood? Well, I was born in 1964. First address was 47, 35 South Indiana. That's uh, the low end in Chicago. It was known as Tobacco Row. Um, my mother was a, she was connected to the music industry in ways. A friend married one of the Womacks. And so I was around the music industry ever since I was a child. I, I per personally got to witness uh, a battle between the Temptations and the Four Tops at the Regal Theater, being behind stage, a little kid. It wasn't until I got older, I realized the significance of what I saw. Um, from 47th Street, I moved to 85th and Oglesby, and then my mother bought a house on 107th Street, 304 West 107th Street. Um, in my travels and moving, being a, I was an only child, my father died when I was four, so it was just me and my mom, and who I be, ultimately became was a person of survival. I started I studied Kung Fu from 1974 on to today because of the bullying and um, having to fend for myself. Um, being from the low end, we talked about each other. Your mama was a bitch. Your mama was a dish. Your mama was a hoe. Your mama was a pimp. Your daddy was this and that. We None of it necessarily was true or false. It was just your mama was what we saw. We slapped box. We wrestled. We boxed. Uh, we... We we uh we used to shadow box. You ever do that? Where I actually act like I punched you, you act like you punched me. That's what we did. We played rock teacher, catch a girl, kiss a girl, whatever. Hell, if I'm not mistaken, we even uh used to pull our pants down and see who penis was the biggest. And this was all before 1974, so I was a little boy. Uh, nothing, no sexual content other than prostitutes giving sex to Johns was in my world because this you know we didn't have social media hell only one person in the neighborhood had a tv most of our entertainment came via radio so that's i say all that to say where i grew up and how that shaped me the one thing i want to add though when i moved from 47th street to 85th and oglesby to a middle income group of people uh my defense was up it was up at a 20 um I guess I didn't feel like I fit in, so I was combative in conversation, defensive, and I was just around other kids just asking questions out of curiosity. No malicious intent from those kids because I'm still friends with them, but I fought with every single person on the block. Coming from a rough neighborhood to a not as rough, but more mental. I went from a physical com combative community to a mental combative community. Shaping me to be a little different. So, that's where I grew up and that's what my childhood was like. Boom. Question number two. When did you know that you were funny? You know what? I don't think I ever knew I was funny. I knew I could entertain. Being an only child, I spent many a days by myself. See, this is one of the things that I said. When my mother punished me, she made me go to my room. But when my mother was happy with me and we celebrated, she made me go to my room. Being the only child living in a small apartment, good or bad, there was no difference because it wasn't. And um, being funny, it was not my goal. My, I was just being creative. You know, my mother lost her. This is the deal. My, my father died when I was four in 1968. We moved, to Cal uh, we moved to Cleveland and we came back from Cleveland because her father passed away. And then her mother, losing her husband, died within 18 months of that. And then her brother died. So by 1974, I had lost my father, grandfather, grandmother, uncle. My mother lost her husband, father, mother, brother. It was just me and her. And that's where my life really started to shape. And what I used to do was entertain my mother. She, she always hosts card parties. I remember one time putting on some red boots, red like... Um, what do you call it? Galoshes, not you know, rubber boots, a dress, a wig. Cause my mother had tons of wigs and ran out. And I was like, women and children first, fire, 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 and just ran out the room. 
And they like, Didi, that was a nickname, your child, something wrong with your child. But they would entertain. Every time she had company, I would go out of the way to entertain. If they played a song on the radio and I knew it, I would come out and lip sync, stuff like that. So it was never about being funny, but I was, I was, I was, uh, I was ignorant to what a boy should and should not do. And also, I think I was an undiagnosed dyslexic recipient. So I did things unintentionally, but people laughed. And it was easy for me to just let people continue to laugh. And in school, I would mess up words. I, I was a very good reader, but I would mess up words because of the dyslexic brain. And instead of admitting that I had a disability, when people say you're always trying to be funny, I, I never correct nobody. And let me say this to you, Pierre. What I mean by my reading issue, I had to go get a coloss, you know, colon cleanse, right? But when I told my wife, I said, I'm getting ready to go get a colony cleanse. And she said, what? I said, oh, I meant to say colon. I said, put the word colon and colony on a piece of paper and see how easy the structure is the same, but you can make a mistake. So now they say I'm going to get my colon cleanse as a spur as opposed to my colony cleanse. And that's where the humor started. So how did you get started in the comedy? I tried comedy in 1983 at a club called Versus on uh, 43rd and Vincennes at a blues room. I had them laughing and I did a gay joke, lost them, and never went back. I got stuck on the word serious. My cousin on the way home kept saying, why do you keep saying serious? Serious, serious. I was 19. So I continued my acting career. And then in 1989, we finished a play. And we went to the Cotton Club as a cast party. And we met Bernie Mac at an open mic. And at the end of open mic, you're like, if you think you're funny, oh yeah, you can come and do this open mic. And everybody from my group was like, wrong, wrong, wrong. And he's like, who the hell is this wrong? And I wasn't, they was, I, I wasn't thinking about comedy. But you know what the deal was? In rehearsal, I was silly, I was disruptive, you know. And, you know, silly and comedy kind of live in the same world. But everything I did back then was about costumes and characters, not just. I wasn't word funny. So, but I got on stage and, you know, for the first time in my theater career, I got instant gratification. People watched me and just me. And then Bernie Mac said I wasn't funny that night, but he told me to go write some jokes and come back. And ultimately he became my mentor and that started my comedy career. So how would you describe your style of humor? As a child, my mother always said, boy, you most unobservant child I know, unobservant. My mother was determined to make sure that I, I paid attention to my envir environment. So observation became a skill set that I was forced to have. Pay attention to your surroundings. I'm from 47th Street, you know, from the ghetto. You know, my father was shot. So my mother was like, pay attention to your surroundings. So ultimately, my comedy style is that of observation. And because I have no limitation on what I can and can't do or what I can and can't talk about, religion, sexuality, color, uh, creed, I talked about any and everything, which made me appear to be, as B. Cole said, I'm the most fearful comedy comic he knows. Yeah, B. Cole always said, Rome, you're the most fearful, fearful, fearless. You're the most fearless comic I know. You can quote that from B. Cole. You're the most fearless comic I know. And and, and, I, and I appreciate that. And you know what it was? I was the most ignorant comic. You'd be surprised how many comedians uh, might stride on their ignorance. I didn't know what I should and should not do. Um, so a lot of my material is observation. And, but what I do that's different from a lot of comedians, I transform in the character of what I'm talking about as opposed to talking about. I've been doing gay comedy for 20 years. You know what I do, Pierre? I transform into the gay character when I'm talking about them. So I'm not saying positive or negative. I'm showing you my version of what I see in gay comedy. And, you know, first it was the hey, the house of this. And then I started noticing the subtle com gay c community. And I started paying attention. And I started adding the 
subtlety, the uh, the upper scale gay community was never it wasn't everybody wasn't you know fabulous and, and extrovert. Some other gay people was introvert. And I remember when I did a headline a comedy show in Boys Town, and I had a room full of gay professionals, and it was not a good show. And I was I came highly recommended. I mean, so many people still enjoyed me, but the problem I had was usually you get energy feedback from the show. I mean, from the audience, and you continue back and forth. Well, this is a very conservative group of homosexual men, and they were just staring at me, and they was taking it in, but they wasn't giving me what I was accustomed to, like being a househead. I was accustomed to uh, you ain't talking about me. None of that came out. And I kind of, I missed some things, but I grew from it. Um, how would you describe, okay, now, what do you think sets you apart from other comedians? Well, for the most part, none of my material ever gets stolen is because I transform into the joke. I, um, back in the day, I used to do the Michael Jackson, the Prince. So it was other comedians. We all did the same, but, you know, we did different versions. So it wasn't about. It wasn't like who cared if you stood or not. You know, I would, I was compared to Sinbad and Arnaz J. Can you imagine me? You know, because they thought I was very, I guess, loud, light skinned, whatever, like a Sinbad, but animated because I did splits, martial arts, anything that I could do in my comedy. It was in, it was on my stage uh, presentation. So that's, I guess you could say that. No, you've branched out from comedy and have moved into more film. Now, that question I branched out, I branched out from from the theater world into stand-up comedy. Keep in mind, I was an actor first. Then I became a comedian. And then the opportunities, when I first jumped into the comedy world, uh, I was cast in the music video. I was, I had the opportunity to be in Soul Food, a movie, because I was with George Tillman and the student films and um, I was, I, a lot of opportunities presented itself. So I was in the acting world, but also stand-up was, was and poetry because we had a coffee shops. Poetry and stand-up was starting to take off and just being entertained, I was there. So I, you know, if it was a mic, I jumped on it. I took the, took advantage of that um, and the light was on me. I was getting a lot of opportunity to perform, perform, perform. But a lot, the light was on me with women. I met my wife. We had a child. And I slowly pulled away at the, I was like they say, we went to the apex of my career. At the early stage, I was there. And I just had to pull out to uh, raise my kids. And I tell people, you know, could you do both? My wife like, you could do both. And it's easy said and done, but there's only so many hours in a day. And I was on my way to a comedy tour. And at this time, my child was at a point where, Dad, I forgot to tell you tomorrow, you have to take me to get my school physical. And me and my wife had a deal that I I did what I did with the kids, and she did what she did. But on Saturday, she was a hairstylist. On Saturday, she would work. So I'm getting ready to go to the airport. And... um. I had to figure out who was going to take my child to get his physical. And I got my mother, but my mother kept saying, no, it took me two hours to convince her. The stress was so high. I went, got on the plane. I told Tony Roberts and I forgot who the other comedian was. And he was like, you just got to beat these kids. And I was like, yeah, but after I beat the kid, I still have to take them to their physical or whatever responsibility you have so that was my last comedy tour and I just I became a father and I, and I would just write jokes at home and I, I observe my relationship so any any joke that I tell with relationships with kids like right now when you, you see if you were to see my my um, routine now Pierre I, I consider myself the inappropriate dad who suffers from PT. OCS. I'm gonna say that again. I'm an inappropriate dad who suffers from PT OCS. That's post-traumatic only child syndrome. And I'm inappropriate because my daughter is now a grown woman, but her friends I watch from little girl to grown women. And now when other people's daughters become grown as a man, 
that's a woman. And I'm like, mm. and I would say things of the sexual nature or just metaphors. They're like, dad, I'm like, what? You so inappropriate. Okay. Um, what's your current, what are you currently working on at this time that you can tell our readers about? Well, actually, since we, we're quarantined, we locked up, right? So I have finished a couple of projects that have been sitting on my desktop, my computer for some, for some years now. So I, I'm finished them out and just let them go. But I finished them. Now I'm working on two sitcoms. One, uh, I want to call it the Chrysler. That's the quarantine crisis counselor, the Chrysler, giving advice to people and how they deal with the quarantine. The other project sitcom I got writers on. I'm, I don't want to share that, but it's a it's a very age appropriate show. I've not seen it, on, and I pay attention to everything. It's not been done, so I think I have a lane that I could that I could dive into. You know, once I do it, I'm sure the word to get out. Other people do it. I might get picked up. I might not. But that's what I'm working on. A sitcom. Um, yeah, let me see. So now, in conclusion, the COVID-19 pandemic has caught us off guard. How are you dealing with it? Oh, well, I just answered that. I am working on projects. Back in November, I rebuilt my production studio. From 2004 to 2014, I was in house doing video production. My very first project was the best of J Deep, the comedian J Deep. I edited and put together him a video that he was selling at his show, the best of J Deep. And after that, I just did whatever production came my way and um, honing my skills in at video, film, and editing. But then in 2014, I got back into comedy. So I'm back in front of the camera. I kind of shut the business down and like I said, November, I picked it back up. Uh, I'm trying to build a new team of comedians and actors and writers to finish some of these projects. You know, brainstorm. We using stuff like House Party or Zoom that we can all chime in together and read scripts to each other and, and, and work out the dialogue. So when this time, if we ever re return back to where we were as far as society I'm going to have a finished project I definitely will um, other than that Rome Anthony I'm a comedian, I'm an actor I'm a singer and I love to just put a smile on people's face so I go ooh -wee! Thank you for the opportunity. I'm Rome Anthony.